Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to, uh, to our keynote address. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Hao Zhang Zhu um, as the keynote for this year's uh, Money Market Conference. Uh, he's the uh, Gordon Y. Billet Professor of Management and Finance and the Associate Professor of Finance at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, he's uh, wildly and, and very well published, um, has done uh, work on a wide range of topics from asset pricing, liquidity, uh, monetary policy implementation, and also um, the impact of technology on, on markets and intermediaries. So he's uh, extremely well placed to, to talk to us today. He's also been, and that's, 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 that's particularly uh, interesting, he's also um, very active in the, uh, in the policy debate on the reform of the benchmark interest rates uh, or the regulation of, um, of derivative markets. And today um, he'll talk about um, another very timely and policy relevant topic, uh, the issue of central bank digital currencies and their design, and in particular on the frontier, trading off paying interest and um, the use of payments of such a digital currency. So Hao Zhang, the, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Florian. And, and I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me uh, to speak and join this fantastic conference. Uh, this is a joint work uh, with uh, Rod Garrett from UCSB and, and Jia Hong Yu, who is, a, who is a PhD student at MIT. And today I want to share with you um, <clears throat> some new research and, and the new thinking, uh, at least from, from my perspective, um, on the CBDC design. Um, so, so first of all, why do we, um, you know, talk about the CBDC? I think this is a uh, kind of recent phenomena um, that CBDC is a digital payment instrument um, that is direct liability of the central bank. And in recent years, the interest in CBDC uh, has been growing steadily, and as shown in this chart uh, published by uh, by the BIS. Uh, if you look at the map globally, uh, clearly many countries have started off um, in research about developments uh, such as US and Europe. Uh, or even piloting and, and implementation, the actual launching of a CBDC. Uh, notably, Sweden and China have started the pilot, um, and I said the Bahamas have uh, already launched its send dollar. Now, why do we need a CBDC? Um, I think CBDC uh, satisfy a, a number uh, of important functions, and, and the two of them are improving payment system and monetary policy implementation. Uh, a CBDC is a digital alternative to cash, um, and it could potentially make the payment system safer, make it more resilient, and thereby in, uh, promoting financial inclusion and financial stability. Uh, on the other hand, uh, by establishing a, a direct link between the central bank and households, the CBDC uh, might be able to help with the monetary policy implementation. And this is precisely uh, in the way um, how the central banks are uh, sort of thinking about it too. Um, today, I will talk about the two specific features, uh, interest bearing and the payment convenience. The interest bearing property um, uh, is, is tightly related to the store value property of a currency, whereas the payment convenience is tightly related to the medium of exchange property of a currency. The third property of currency, which is a unit of account, is automatically satisfied if it is a CBDC, as it is legal tender uh, in the country. Uh, now, these two dimensions also got reflected uh, in the ECB's digital euro report, for example, uh, it's a good report showing a number of requirements uh, that a successful CBDC should have. And the first requirement is about uh, enhance the digital efficiency that the digital currency got to be usable. Uh, usability, convenience, speed, cost efficiency, uh, and even programmability. The fourth one, fourth requirement is about monetary policy implementation, right? If it is a tool for monetary policy, the digital euro should be remunerated at interest rate that the central bank could control and modify over time. Uh, likewise, in the U.S., uh, here is a uh, Banking for All Act from the U.S. Congress. We understand that the Fed has been uh, still deliberating, but the Congress already put up a bill. Uh, as far as I know, it's not voted on yet. Uh, but you can see that it's a very similar vein, uh, talking about the digital dollar, uh, got to pay interest, and it has to offer all the services that you could get from your bank accounts. Now, the third example I want to give uh, is China, which has, has already started the experimentation of the uh, RMB, CBDC. Uh, it is the manager of the system, um, kind of two-tiered, and it is meant to be an alternative to cash, so it does not pay any interest, uh, but it has some interesting features, uh, such as offline transactions. So, so Chinese CBDC has picked a particular combination of interest bearing, which is zero, and certain functionalities uh, of payments. Um, so the question we are asking here is, given that the central banks are actually thinking about uh, these two design features, 
then what are the implications? In our model, we are going to um, think about the CBDC as offered via the commercial banks. So it is a two-tier system, uh, which is like China or Swedish design. And in a way, it's not far away from uh, how the Fed or the ECB thought about it. Um, we're going to kind of embed the CBDC in a practical modeling framework in which a large bank and a small bank compete in deposit market and the lending market. Now, what do we find? Um, interest bearing feature of the CBDC puts a lower bound on the deposit interest rate that the banks pay to households. Uh, by raising the interest on the CBDC, um, the central bank is able to speed up monetary policy transmission. Uh, but the downside of it is that it's going to further reduce the market share of the small bank. Uh, the idea is that by shrinking the central bank policy rate, um, you know, the interest rate paid to the, paid to the banks, and the CBDC rate paid to households, it leaves little space uh, for the small bank to compete. That's why the small bank would lose market share. On the other hand, if the CBDC is very easy to use, uh, for example, for payments, that's going to level the playing field by raising uh, the market share of the small bank and achieving away the advantage uh, of the large bank. And, and the, the impact of the interest, sorry, of the convenience CBDC on monetary policy transmission uh, turns out to be quite a nuanced and uh, it could either go up or down uh, depending on the parameter. The next slide we're going to look at is to look at how the major stakeholders view CBDC in our model. Turns out banks and households have very different views about the interest bearing feature. Uh, households prefer the central bank to pay the interest and higher the better, but the banks uh, prefer exactly the opposite. But interestingly, we find that um, in some conditions, uh, banks and households actually agree on the convenience feature. So in other words, if the CBDC is easy to use, not only does it benefit the households, it also benefits the banks. Uh, and this idea or this result kind of lead us to the last uh, point about the frontier. That is, can we construct a set of desirable combinations of interest rate and convenience value of the CBDC so that uh, people kind of prefer this combination uh, to, to anything, uh, anything else? Um, so here is an illustration of what we have so far on the uh, horizontal axis. We have the CBDC interest rate. On the virtual axis, we have the, the convenience value. And you can see that it is uh, uh, almost like a hump-shaped uh, pattern. And any particular point uh, on the frontier actually dominates any point below. Um, so that's, that's our idea of having the frontier. That is, uh, we, we would actually go on to go here. Um, so, the, so the good CBDC design uh, would not have a zero convenience value. And of course, the exact design the central bank picks would depend on the objective. I will be more explicit um, later. Okay. In the interest of the time, I'm going to skip the literature um, and, and let me go uh, go to the model before talking about the implications. The um, model uh, has has one uh, large bank and one small bank. The bank's assets are assumed to be uh, reserves, and the liabilities are deposits. Uh, we just keep it very simple. Um, the reserves amounts are very large, denoted by X. The central bank pays interest uh, on the reserves. Uh, we call that F. And the banks would set endogenous interest rate, RL and RS, on the deposits. Um, what is the difference between the, the large and the small bank? There is only one difference in our model. The large bank deposit is easier to use for payments and other functionalities. Uh, here I'm showing, uh, you know, it's a, it's a super app uh, um, screenshot. You can see that in this super app, uh, lots of services got embedded in this, this one app. So it's like one stop shop. Um, you know, this might be too extreme to think about a, a bank, um, but when we think about the large bank offering a lot of services, a better app may extend the bank net network so that uh, it has a convenience value uh, for consumers. And we denote the convenience value to be delta that has a distribution G across the unit mass of agents or households. And we can normalize the small bank's deposits convenience value to be zero. So the key advantage of large bank is that its deposit is easier to use. Um, now, what about the CBDC? The CBDC comes to the picture um, as a central bank's liability, but it's going to be offered through commercial banks. So I'm showing this uh, sort of schematic. This is how I think about it personally. Um, if I want to have a CBDC account, I'm going to um, go to one of the two banks, say this is a Deutsche Bank maybe, and I will open an account uh, with a large bank. Once I have the account, I can really transfer my money between the commercial bank deposit account and the central bank account sponsored by the large bank seamlessly, right? So money transfer uh, within this, these two accounts would be very easy. Once I do that, I'm able to get this uh, CBDC app and I can transfer money between my bank account and the CBDC account uh, seamlessly. 
So, so in, by doing that, I'm able to use the CBDC app uh, to do stuff such as uh, touch, you know, touch pay or scan pay. Um, if I have a small account, a small bank account, then clearly I can do the same thing. As you can notice that because the small bank does not have so much uh, functionalities as, as large bank does, uh, having the CBDC is actually to help the small bank uh, customers to get access to more uh, advanced technology and the easier use uh, of payment services. So what the implications is that once the CBDC gets introduced, um, the, the, the small bank customers actually get the convenience value V rather than zero, whereas large bank customer get the convenience value, which is the maximum of delta and V. And the delta, um, again, is the uh, agent specific preference for the large bank deposit. Now, because of the convenience value of the CBDC, um, we're going to see that the CBDC's interest rate, we're going to call S, is going to be a lower bound of the commercial bank deposit interest rate. Um, so, so I just want to emphasize that to, for this inequality to be credible, it has to be the case that the central bank deposit, sorry, the central bank um, uh, currency is easy to use and, and easily manageable um, for the households. Okay, in terms of the timeline, um, there will be three periods. Um, in the beginning, uh, the banks would set the interest, interest rate, RL and RS, the central bank would set the IOER or IORF, which we take as exogenous. The two design variables are the CBDC interest rate S and the CBDC convenience value V. Every household in the beginning already has an account with either bank, large or small. Uh, in period one, the household kind of act as, as borrowers or entrepreneurs. They draw the projects. The projects differ in quality uh, called a Q. And they're going to go to their existing bank to borrow. Uh, the existing bank is assumed to be a monopolist in, in the loan market, to make it simple. Um, if a loan is granted, then the funded entrepreneur is going to pay a randomly match the worker uh, wage, that's the, the $1 borrowed. Now, 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 the whole point about having the worker is to generate some flow of funds in the economy, and the worker gets, gets the wage and is going to choose where she deposits the wage, depending on the interest rates of the two banks and the convenience value uh, of the two banks. So before solving the model, let me just uh, show you uh, one table uh, that kind of illustrates the, the, the pattern uh, that uh, advantage in the deposit market translates into advantage in the lending market. So on the top, we have the original balance sheet of the large bank. In the middle, the large bank lends a dollar on the euro to entrepreneur. And that works is that it's going to create a loan in the name of the, of the borrower and create a new deposit in the name of the borrower. Um, and then the entrepreneur is going to spend the dollar to pay a uh, worker or suppliers. Now the question is, does the dollar leave the bank? Um, in the model with the two banks or any kind of discrete large banks, um, the bank's market share right here, large bank is alpha L. So with the probability alpha L, the deposit actually stays with the bank because the worker banks with the same bank. And only with the probability alpha S, which is one minus alpha L, deposit the leaves, right? Um, so in this case, um, the newly created deposit does not necessarily leave the bank uh, after, after the payments. So that's, you know, in a way, the advantage of a large bank. I'll show you here. The total profit of making a loan for the large bank is shown on the bottom. You can see that the first term, uh, group of terms, is net profit on the loan. And we think about F as the opportunity cost of funds because the bank could deposit the money with the central bank um, to earn the interest on F. Now, the second term is, is the key. Um, of, uh, in the sense of the model, um, we see that the alpha L is the probability the money stays with the bank and F minus RL is the interest rate spread. So this number will be greater in equilibrium than the corresponding number for the small bank. And that's going to give the large bank one advantage um, in, the, in, the, in the lending market. Um, so projects that the small bank view as not profitable uh, might be um, profitable for the large bank. Just to motivate a little further, is that realistic that alpha is greater than zero? In the US, the three top banks in terms of the deposit uh, amount, Bank of America, Chase, and Wells Fargo, holds about 10% each. Citibank holds about 4%. You can see that uh, if Chase lends out a dollar, then with about 10% of probability, and conditionally, the money actually stays with the Chase. That is not a trivial number. Um, okay, just uh, very quickly um, solve the model. Um, in the period two, we see the depositors are going to choose where to put the money in. Um, and again, by going to the large bank, 
the depositor get this value uh, for convenience by going to the small bank, it goes to this value of convenience B. And, and we can see that um, if the small banks, sorry, if the, if the, if the consumer's um, advantage, uh, sorry, the preference for large bank is large enough, then the consumer is going to pick the large bank. We are going to uh, focus on parameters that leads to a small bank paying a higher interest, which seems to be quite intuitive and, and realistic um, from, from our experience. Um, so the small bank's market share is given at the bottom. And the later we'll see that as V goes up, um, alpha S will go up. This is not the trivial result because RS minus RL actually varies. Um, so, so in the end, the change in the deposit interest rate offered by the banks would not mitigate the impact of V um, so that a higher V convenience value of the CBDC does uh, benefit the small bank's market share. Okay. Lending, uh, we just talked about it um, from this um, equation by imposing the zero uh, or break even condition, we can get the lending standards. The result is that the lending standards of the large bank is a little lower uh, because the second term is a little higher, right? So there's almost like a, a second profit to be made uh, on the loan. So, so the bank could afford to have a slightly lower queue. And then finally, um, this final slide is sort of on the, on the model solution. Uh, we're going to look at the total profit of the two banks. Um, the first source of the profit is the, is the loan, and the second source is the, is the deposit spread. Here we can see that if X is very large, then that's going to dominate um, the, the loan amount. Even though we solve the model, uh, I guess, for any generic parameter, uh, I guess in today's market, we do see a, a huge number of reserves, so X is likely to be large. And, and here, think about this term, uh, would be the interest rate spread the bank would earn um, between the deposit and the central bank rate. All right. Um, so there are two cases of equilibrium, uh, I'll just describe it, describe it verbally. Uh, in the first case, the CBDC interest rate, uh, S, is not binding, meaning uh, either the rate is so low, like zero, or if the central bank policy rate is, is high, like F equal to 3%. In that case, this large bank and small bank's deposit interest rate uh, it's already away from a zero lower bound and away from the lower bound of S, so it's not binding. In the other case, such as when uh, in the world we are in today, or sort of in the foreseeable future, that rate is not going to be so high so that the central bank uh, digital currency interest rate may well be the binding interest rate um, for, for, the, for the large bank. So, so the CBDC interest rate becomes a new lower bound. Uh, lower bound is no longer zero, but the CBDC interest rate. So in both cases of equilibrium, we have the large banks at the lower deposit interest rate. We have the large banks at uh, a larger market share, have lower lending standard, as well as higher profit. Uh, let me just emphasize that in this model, the CBDC is actually not held, right? Think about this. It's, it's a model about the CBDC, and yet it is not held. Uh, therefore, it does not really disintermediate all the banks. Um, nonetheless, the CBDC is still quite effective as a viable outside option uh, the way it is viable, again, is because it does provide payment functionality and it because it's offered through the banks so that it is a, almost a perfect substitute uh, for bank deposit and, and a better substitute to the extent that it offers better uh, payment convenience than the small bank deposits. Now we're ready to talk about the implications uh, by varying these two dimensions, interest rate and convenience value. Um, so, here, let me show you the chart first before the formal pro uh, proposition. Um, here, we are setting the interest rate of the central bank interest rate, policy rate should be 2%. And for now, we set the convenience value to be zero and kind of isolate the impact of a CBDC interest rate. As that interest rate goes up, uh, we can see that the large bank interest rate goes up uh, with it in tandem. So this is the constraint equilibrium where the large bank's interest rate is equal to the CBDC interest rate. The black line shows that the weighted average interest rate in the market goes up. Um, so as the uh, rate goes to uh, you know, further, further higher, you can see that the weighted average interest rate can converge to the policy rate. So that is good for monetary policy transmission. Uh, but the downside is that the small bank would start to lose market share. The intuition is that as the interest rate between the large bank and the small bank start to narrow, um, the depositor would say, well, why do I uh, have to use a small bank now? Uh, the small bank's you know, interest rate is not a lot higher, and I could use uh, the large bank for its other uh, services and the payment convenience. So that's why the large bank started to gain market share. Um, so this is uh, sort of unintended consequence of having a high interest bearing capacity uh, in the CBDC. 
And likewise, we see that uh, very similarly in the lending market, loan volume goes down um, in small bank and goes up in large bank. And that kind of maps uh, back to the, the deposit market share um, divergence. Total lending volume in this example goes down um, mildly. Now, now, more formally, we have pretty much all the competitive statics under certain conditions. Um, that for if, if the deposit, if the reserve amount is, is large enough, uh, then we can show that the higher central bank digital currency interest rate a speed up monetary monetary transmission to make um, the weighted average interest rate closer to F, uh, whereas it harms the small bank uh, by reducing the activities in the lending and uh, and and uh, and the deposit market of the small bank. Um, so that's kind of interesting uh, tension right here. All right, so that is the, the interest bearing feature. What about the second feature, which is the uh, convenience value? Now, the convenience value turns out to have quite distinct uh, properties. So here again, I'm showing the corner solution, uh, sorry, the, the specific case where S is equal to zero. Uh, so there's zero uh, interest bearing, and, and the policy rate by the central bank is still 2%. Now, we are going to increase the convenience value. So here, 1% uh, simply means that the CBDC is so convenient that um, depositors are willing to give up 1% interest rate per year to hold that kind of uh, payment instrument. As the CBDC convenience value goes up, in this equilibrium, we can see that the large bank interest rate in blue got stuck at zero. It is at the lower bound. And the small bank's deposit interest rate actually goes down. Why is that? This is because the small bank, um, you know, starting with a disadvantage, now have a smaller disadvantage, right? Because remember, the small bank depositors can now use the CBDC to hold to 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 make payments and uh, and do other things. So the small bank does not have to offer as high deposit interest rate to attract customers. Uh, nonetheless, uh, despite this drop in the small bank interest rate, we see that the small bank market share goes up. Uh, again, this is because the small bank's market share is given by the interest rate spread plus V. As V goes up, uh, the small bank's market share goes up. Um, the, the large bank's interest rate does not move, um, and, and the, the, the weighted average interest rate in the economy actually goes down. So this is when the monetary policy transmission um, gets actually worse. Uh, however, once the equilibrium transit into this region, um, where the large banks start to lift up interest rate away from the lower bound, we see that the weighted average interest rate start to go up. So the monetary policy transmission in this world is quite nuanced and quite rich. It's more or less of a U-shaped pattern. Uh, lending market is very similar. The small bank gains market share, um, exhibited by, on the right, uh, increase in lending volume, and the uh, large bank uh, loses lending volume. The total lending volume, as the black line showing on the right, is almost flat. Numerically, it goes down mildly, but, but it's but extremely small. Okay? Um, so we can see that the, the property of a, of a convenient CBDC is distinct in the sense that it is strictly benefit the small bank in deposit and the lending market, therefore level them playing field, uh, but it has a quite uh, nuanced impact uh, on monetary policy transmission. Okay? Now, on this point, where when I say it's unclear, uh, it is truly unclear. Uh, here is one example, and, and you can see that um, in this particular example, where the policy rate is 3% and the CBDC pays interest rate of 1.25%, uh, one the equilibrium will be constrained. Uh, but the total lending volume is actually not monotone in CBDC convenience value V. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, uh, another thing to notice is that on the left, we see that the magnitude here uh, is, is quite small. The impact is not too large, and, and the, the larger uh, effect is, is still the reallocation of lending volume between the large and, uh, and the small banks. Okay? So what I have shown so far is that interest-bearing capacity and the convenience value of the CBDC have rather distinct properties in terms of uh, shift market share in the, in the economy, as well as monetary policy transmission. At this point, uh, one possible approach is actually to, um, to specify a central bank objective and try to solve, um, in, in a sense, the optimal design, right? Um, but right now, we're going to try to experiment a new approach. Um, now, this approach uh, is this uh, CBDC frontier idea. The idea is that before launching the CBDC, or even after it, uh, a successful CBDC should require uh, a broad support. So before thinking about a central bank objective, um, and, and we should also think about uh, how would the major stakeholders view this uh, you know, innovation. 
Um, so in a sense, a frontier is really a combination of interest bearing and, and convenience value as the V pairs that both stakeholders in our economy, meaning the households and banks, prefer. And after that, uh, the central bank uh, would now have a fewer uh, points to, to, to choose from, and then the design really depends on the central bank objective. Uh, let me just illustrate how, how, the, how this works. Um, starting from the households, um, here quite intuitively, households prefer convenience value and prefer interest. So, so, so clearly their welfare would increase in S and increase in V in general, and in fairly uh, uh, mild conditions. Um, as, as an illustration, you, uh, kind of graphically, we are plotting the indifference curves of the uh, depositors. Right here on the, on the x-axis, we have the CBDC interest rate, and on the, on, the, on the vertical one, we have the convenience value. Uh, the blue dots represent the constrained equilibrium, where RL equals to, to S, and unconstrained equilibrium with RL greater than S. Uh, we can see that when the interest rate is low, here's 2%, most of the region is covered uh, by constraint, sorry, by the, uh, by the constrained equilibrium, and the maximum convenience value that the household prefers uh, is actually, um, sorry, this typo is a 0 0.35. So, <clears throat> so this is a 3.5%. Um, <clears throat> we can see that the households generally prefer to go uh, northeast, right? They prefer a higher convenience value and they prefer um, a higher interest rate. Now this boundary right here uh, basically characterizes um, RL, here's RL equals RS equals S, whereas here is RL uh, equals RS, uh, greater than S. Um, so, so we believe, uh, at least for now, we have not intent the, the combinations of S and V such that it pushes the, the, the composition of the markets so far that the large bank no longer have the advantage in interest rate. Uh, so we are kind of looking uh, within this boundary. That's what we have characterized in equilibrium. Um, so again, households prefer to go north uh, east. The banks. Um, the bank's total profits um, as spelled out in this equation, and we can show that, uh, interestingly, it increases in V in the constrained equilibrium. Uh, what it means uh, in, in the graph is that they are willing to go northwest, okay? Um, and, and that's sort of in the blue region. Uh, just focus on the blue region. If, if you are in any blue region right here, let's say, um, the bank will strictly prefer to go here and go here and go here, right? Uh, so they would want to go to the northwest. Uh, in this case, um, the, the, under the numerical examples, in the, in, the, in the green region, the bank's welfare, um, so the bank profit, I would say bank profit, actually goes down in V. Um, so once you reach the boundary, the bank doesn't want to go uh, northwest anymore, okay? Uh, moreover, we show that the higher V increases the minimum of the two banks' profits, and, and that has the implication on financial stability if we think about stability is measured by the weaker um, of, of the two banks, then raising the, the minimum uh, profit of the two uh, does enhance stability a little bit. So now with the households and the banks' um, preferences specified, uh, we, we can now kind of think about the, the frontier. So the frontier consists of um, uh, this, you can see this orange curve, and below the orange, that's the constrained equilibrium where the central bank uh, digital currency rate sorry, uh, I should say that RL uh, is equal to S, where IS is greater than S, where S is the central bank digital currency interest rate. Um, the red curve represents the household's welfare, right? So this would go uh, Northeast, and, and the blue represents the bank's profit, they would want to go Northwest. So, so the way to think about it is that suppose we fix, fix uh, on this curve, right? This red curve, we're gonna ask the question, well, uh, the households are just indifferent on this curve, where would the banks prefer? Banks prefer to go up, right? So you would end up uh, on this point. The, the idea is that within the constrained region, um, and curiously, we do have a agreement between household and banks, um, even though they strongly disagree on the interest rate dimension, they do agree on the convenience value dimension. So they do prefer the, the, the CBDC to have good convenience value properties. The intuition for the households is quite simple. They, they, they want to uh, you know, pay me the functionality, and for the bank, the intuition is that once the CBDC interest rate, well, sorry, once the CBDC convenience value goes up, the banks no longer have to pay as much interest rate uh, in the deposit account to customers. Uh, that's why the banks are also um, kind of better off, okay? Now, from this point on, um, we could ask, well, uh, on this frontier, which is orange curve, 
um, where, where do we want to go? And that actually depends on the central bank objectives. So this is where we bring back the central bank's objective and all these comparative statics that I have shown you before. Um, for example, if we prefer to have monetary policy pass through as thoroughly as possible, uh, we can actually pick the corner, right? This way on, on the right, we do have the weighted average interest rate going uh, all the way to uh, policy rate F, 2%. Um, if the central bank interest rate, sorry, if the CBDC interest rate goes to uh, 2%. Uh, likewise, depositor uh, welfare is maximizes, uh, maximized if we pick the CBDC interest rate equal to the policy rate. Um, the bank's total profit is maximized right here, and this corresponds to this point, interestingly. Um, so the CBDC interest rate that CBDC design that maximizes the bank's profit does have actually non-trivial convenience value. Uh, again, the intuition is that by providing convenience value, uh, the banks could sort of um, pay less uh, in, in terms of a deposit interest rate um, and it sort of let users uh, or depositors uh, use the central bank's uh, payment functionality rather than bank's functionality. Now that's sort of one possible, uh, a few possible designs. And, and here's another example. What if the bank, uh, the central bank, wants to level the playing field as much as possible? Well, in our simple model, level the playing field simply means the small bank has a higher market share, and, and that is maximized right here in this point. So the small bank would have uh, equal market share with the large bank uh, on that tip, and that would correspond to this particular point on the left. So in this example, we have central bank rate to be 2%, and you can see that the interest rate is roughly 25 basis point, and the convenience value is about 1.7%. Now, 1.7% is quite high, suggesting that the payment functionality of the CBDC um, got to be so good that a usual depositor would be willing to give up 1.7% uh, of deposit interest rate per year to get to use uh, that, that functionality. And likewise, um, if the central bank wants to maximize uh, financial stability, uh, that is going to raise the weaker of the two banks um, and, and clearly the answer is still the TB point, okay? So, so just to summarize right here, once we have the frontier, the central bank could think about the different objectives and, and now look for a narrow set um, rather than looking through this two-dimensional design problem um, and, and kind of looking through, you know, all these different objectives on this frontier seems to be a sort of a little easier uh, operationally. Okay, um, I don't have my doing on time, but, but let me uh, maybe conclude. So in this paper, we are looking at the interest rate and the convenience trade-off in CBDC design. These two features have a dra dramatically different implications. Monetary policy pass-through um, is sort of favored by higher CBDC interest rate, but a higher CBDC interest rate uh, does reduce the, the small bank's market share. A higher CBDC convenience value, payment functionalities, level than playing field, but it's going to have a quite a nuanced impact of monetary policy transmission. Um, the frontier is constructed by asking banks and depositors or households, would you prefer this design or the other? And we can eliminate all the dominated options, which is below this orange curve. So now we can kind of uh, go into this frontier and, and ask the question, uh, well, for each individual central bank, what are the objectives and what is the design uh, kind of meet this objective by selecting from a fewer, um, fewer design points? Thank you. Thank you, Zhang. Um, this was uh, great and, and, and shows how intricate the problem is, how many moving parts one has to consider when thinking about uh, digital currencies, central bank digital currencies uh, um, in the economy as a whole. I have two questions in the chat um, and we have, we have about nine minutes left. We can also like, you know, finish a little bit earlier to get back on, on schedule, but let me let me read out these these two questions to you. Um, one of them, I think, refers to your two layered approach, and it says, um, mm -hmm. does it matter whether I think of the CBDC as only offering interbank services versus offering direct deposits for households? Uh, and that was from Jay Khan. And the second question from Leili. Um, uh, is, is is zooming in on on how to model deposit behavior. So, what if banks need to compete for deposits to fund? 
in the model, it seems that borrowers deposit their loans to the lending bank, so banks do not need to raise additional funding. And how would this affect um, the equilibrium? Um, great. Th thank you for the question. On the first one, um, I think that's a question of uh, a retail CBDC versus wholesale CBDC. So, so we are talking about households, so this is more of a re retail CBDC phenomenon. Um, the, the idea is that uh, the central bank may not want to deal with all these uh, you know, know your customer, any money laundering, there's a lot of uh, paperwork and, uh, and the process to be done. And the commercial banks already have the infrastructure to do this. Um, so, so why don't, you know, let the commercial banks or, or other uh, intermediaries, um, you know, help the central bank doing the, doing the paperwork and the sponsor this, you know, the CBDC accounts via the commercial banks. Um, so that's kind of a practical concern. And, and the second, um, I think the more economic reason is that for the CBDC to be, become effective in, um, in, in transmitting monetary policy, it has to be, in a way, a kind of viable outside option. Um, if the CBDC is offered in a standalone basis, it may or may not uh, be as easy to use as large bank deposits. Um, so, for example, a large bank deposits, you know, give the information to the large bank and the bank sees all the deposit flows, may offer you some other services such as credit, such as brokerage. And if the payment accounts go through a CBDC, uh, the central bank doesn't offer those services and, and somehow, you know, the, the depository may still use the use large bank deposits. So the idea of offering the CBDC through the commercial banks is that whatever payment activity the customer has is going to be visible by the, by the, by the large bank anyway. Um, so that makes the information content also usable um, to the benefit of the consumers, right? So that's sort of the two reasons why I think it's kind of reasonable to use a two-tiered approach. One is practical, the other is to make the CBDC a truly a viable outside option. Um, uh, on this question uh, about the modeling, um, maybe I should emphasize this a bit more. In our economy, we are talking about um, today's, say, the US or Europe, where the central bank have a huge amount of reserves. And uh, the idea is that when the bank lends out um, to fund the projects, uh, the amount of reserves the bank has with the central bank is really not a constraint, right? So, so, so lending is determined not by how much reserves you have, uh, rather it is determined by the opportunity cost of uh, capital and by the, by the total profit. And we show that um, the, it is the large bank that actually has a, you know, effectively lower cost of the funding. Um, they, they do compete in the deposit market, you know, by varying interest rate, but when they lend, um, they, they do not have to worry about the raised funding, right? Because indeed, they actually create a deposit and let the deposit flow. So, so that's a slightly different uh, from the pre-crisis world when the, when the reserves were a little smaller. So we can talk about maybe reserve requirement matters. But right now, uh, re reserves are so, so abundant and so flush, uh, in US and Europe at least, that lending uh, probably wouldn't depend uh, on reserves. And by the way, there was also work by Yimin Ma showing that, you know, with their shots on banks funding, uh, through money market mutual funds, uh, that doesn't seem to be a huge impact on lending, right? That also supports the idea that, you know, in the age with ample reserves, lending is not really tied up to the level of reserves. Thank you for those questions. Do we have um, other questions? Otherwise, I, I use my, uh, my spot here to, to ask uh, two more questions. Um, one of them, I guess they're, they're both modeling questions again. But, but asking, you know, to what extent one can step outside the model a little bit. So, you know, you have yeah. this, this structure with the large bank and the small banks, and of course, that's very convenient. But, um, you know, how would, you know, how would this um, generalize to a situation where we would have competition among several banks? Um, and And the other thing that I was a bit curious is that, you know, a, an important margin in your model was this F minus the interest rate. So the interest on reserves minus the, the interest that you have to pay to depositors. And this is the, you know, spread that banks can earn. Now, yep. in the euro area, that spread is negative, right? You pay zero on the deposits and minus <laughs> uh, on the, uh, you know, on, on the deposit with the central bank. So can your model accommodate this or, or you know, would something strange happen thanks uh great question um especially <laughs> the second one about negative spread so let me come to the first one i think competition among several banks would work uh typically when we think about bank competition um you know deposit account seems to be sticky 
So, so one thing I think a feature of the model is that we do not have any search friction in the deposit market, so people can switch anytime they want. Um, so, so the reason that you know the banks still have a bit of bargaining power is that the large bank um, does have a have a convenience value advantage, right? Um, so now, if we have several homogeneous banks then one could use the euro techniques that you know, each bank might have a local customer like loyal uh, clientele uh, that would prefer this bank. And then there are others who can search. In this case, one could have a sort of sim more of a symmetric equilibrium where the banks would compete maybe using mixed strategies, maybe pure strategies, depending on the, on the structure. Uh, but, but the key, I think, uh, it could um, kind of apply there as well. Um, now, now the, on the second question about um, F minus R being negative, it is completely defined uh, in our model that you know, you know all the comparative statics actually do not uh, require this number to be positive. Um, in, instead, what was kind of at least in the search of equilibrium, uh, we are looking at the central bank um, uh, interest rate S to be between zero and F. Now, of course, if F itself is negative, then um, then, then the central bank uh, you know interest rate might might be negative as well. So so I think that it does open up uh, some interesting issues, um, but I think. You know, in terms of the model, uh, it, it should more or less work through. Um, now the question is, you know, if all the if both of, both of the banks start to offer zero rate, right, because the depositors doesn't want to lose value, um, does that mean the small bank uh, would lose market share to the large bank? In our model, um, that's the prediction, right? Because they they both got a negative forty uh, from ECB, then they pay zero, um, or, or they pay zero to depositors. That's negative forty basis point spread. Uh, that's equal between the large and small bank. So the prediction is that in that world, uh, indeed, we would have large bank gaining market share. In general, in our model, uh, at least in this kind of model, um, a, a lower interest rate kind of leads to um, kind of a rise of market share uh, for the large bank and a drop in market share of, uh, of the small bank. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Florence. Unless there are any other questions, we are pretty much up against the allotted time. So. Uh, Thanks again, Hao Zhang, for, uh, you know, for the great keynote.